Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's installment of our Lunch Bites series. Uh, my name is Samuel Holliday, and I have the uh, great pleasure and privilege of serving as Director of Operations and Scholarship here at the United States Capitol Historical Society. Um, we're so glad that so many of you have taken time out of your uh, busy days to join us for this interesting, fascinating discussion uh, of the history and present realities of congressional redistricting. Before we get into today's discussion with our wonderful experts, I'd like to go over a couple of technical housekeeping matters. Uh, you know, while we uh, are still limited in how we can engage with you directly uh, in person, we love using this Zoom webinar platform to engage with you, our supporters and our audience. Uh, as we proceed through today's panel, as we proceed through today's discussion, if you have any content questions for Kyle or David, you can put them into the, the Q&A section of the webinar. It looks like two speech bubbles, either at the top or bottom of your screen, depending on which device you're using to join us. If you have any technical troubleshooting matters, if you feel like you're having difficulty hearing us or seeing us uh, over the course of today's program, uh, you can go ahead and put those technical troubleshooting matters into the chat section. I will be keeping an eye on that and answering in real time. So once again, any content questions for Kyle or David can go into the Q&A section of the webinar. It's now also my great pleasure to introduce the President and CEO of the United States Capitol Historical Society, Jane Campbell, to start today's program. Jane? Thank you, Sam. Um, as always, we are so grateful for the work that you do behind the scenes to bring the Lunch Bites to life uh, with interesting speakers and good content. Uh, we welcome all of our participants. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, this Lunch Bite is part of a continuing series that we have been doing about congressional procedure. Um, and David Hawkins has become sort of our go-to uh, guy who translates congressional procedure into English uh, for people who are not deep in the middle of all of the minutia of congressional procedure. So today, uh, we're going to be talking about congressional redistricting, which is quite timely. For those of you who don't know David, uh, David has been a longtime journalist focusing on congressional politics, um, but came, came with an interesting background, um, worked as the assistant city editor for San Antonio Light, covering City Hall and all that activity, spent time on the Hill, uh, working for Texas Republican Lamar Smith, uh, during his initial campaign. And so there's stories from the Hill. No wonder he's such a good uh, journalist. Um, and one of his podcasts was called Roll Call Decoder. Can you imagine? So David is our, our decoder and we appreciate him being with us. And today we have another special guest, Kyle Kondik. Uh, Kyle in, is of course special to me because he's from Northeast Ohio. Although I have to, <clears throat> I must admit, I did not know him in Northeast Ohio. Uh, but for those of you who follow things closely, you know I have quite a fondness for Northeast Ohio as my home. But Kyle is the managing editor of Sabato's Crystal Ball, uh, which is the University of Virginia's Center for Politics authoritative, non authoritative nonpartisan newsletter. And it is one of the go to experts on all matters politics, particularly matters um, political. I've had the opportunity on many occasions to be briefed uh, by the uh, University of Virginia Center on Politics, uh, always in a nonpartisan manner, always full of incredible information. Uh, we're fat, honored to have Kyle with us today. He's really developed quite an expertise in congressional redistricting. Um, he is going to start us off, uh, and just to give you a sense of his background, he's not always been a, just a think tank person. He's also been in the fray of political activity, uh, working with former Attorney General Rich Cordray, uh, where he was involved in the communications and policy side of Attorney General Cordray's activities in Ohio. So Kyle's going to give us a good historical perspective turn it over to David for a sense of some stories about how it affects Congress. And as always, we include you in the questions and answers. So put those questions and answers in and I will uh, feed them to our distinguished panelists when they're done. So Kyle, start us off. 
Uh, thank you, Mayor Campbell, and thanks for uh, having me here today. Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna give just a little bit of a historical background uh, on, on redistricting and, and the, the phenomenon of so-called gerrymandering. Uh, the term gerrymandering, it's named for Elbridge Gary. So it was, he, his last name is, is, is Gary, but, but uh, it, it turned into Jerry with, with, with a J basically, or soft G uh, over history. But uh, it refers to a, uh, arguably one of the most famous uh, uh, editorial cartoons of all time, the famous Gerrymander, which was a, uh, a, a district drawn in Massachusetts to, uh, that was designed to benefit the Democratic Republicans at the time. Although interestingly, um, the district was drawn in 1812 and the following year, the, the Federalists actually won it, which is, is an indicator that sometimes gerrymandering doesn't always work the way that, that you hope, um, but you know you could you could go back to the colonial period, um, and there are also examples of, of districts that are drawn basically to benefit benefit one side over the other, which is what we're talking about with partisan gerrymandering. Uh, another famous example is that James Madison won won a race for the U.S. House over James Monroe, another future president, uh, in, in a district that uh, that many felt was 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 sort of gerrymandered in, in, in a way to to benefit Monroe, but Monroe did not. Um, end up winning. Uh, there are various instances over the course of US history where um, the collective gerrymandering efforts in a given state were thought to have actually affected the control of Congress. Uh, for instance, a uh, gerrymander of Pennsylvania in 1888 is thought to have been crucial uh, uh, that year in the Republicans winning control of Congress. Uh, gerrymanders in New York and California in 1952 uh, also were thought at the time to have been crucial in the Republicans winning the House majority that year, which was one of only two times the Republicans won the U.S. House majority um, from uh, uh, the early 1930s all the way through the Republican Revolution of, 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 of 1994. Um, redistricting used to happen in kind of a haphazard fashion in the United States, uh, and there are still no federal prohibitions on how often you can draw the districts. Now, um, we've gotten into this, this sort of regular pattern where the districts are drawn uh, every, every 10 years after the census. But for instance, in, um, in uh, my home state of Ohio, the districts were redrawn six times between 1878 and 1890. And it was, it was a time of really frequent redistricting. Uh, the Pennsylvania example I mentioned too is sort of, is sort of part of that. And then over time, uh, you actually had a form of kind of gerrymandering that was through malapportionment, which meant that the districts were sort of, they just were left alone. They didn't adjust with, with population size changes. And so after, for instance, Ohio redistricted so many times in the late 1880s uh, or in, in, in the late 1800s, uh, Ohio then went from 1914 to 1952 without drawing new maps at all. And sometimes when states would get a new congressional district, um, instead of drawing a new district, they would just have a statewide at large member. Um, and part of what was going on is that, uh, you know, over time, obviously urban areas began to grow in, in, in strength. And the 1920 census was sort of this landmark in that it was the first time that it showed that a majority of Americans actually lived in cities and the rural dominated state legislatures and rural dominated Congress didn't really want to deal with that that fact. And so the, the 1920 census is the only time where there wasn't actually a reapportionment of house seats um, in that it, 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 after, after that census, it took until 1929 for there actually to be um, a, a reapportionment of the seats based on, based on population. And part of what happened in, that, in the 1929 reapportionment was that um, there really weren't a, effective uh, rules preventing districts from being malapportioned, you know, one district having many more people than the other. Um, but Congress kind of opened the door to even more malapportionment. So a lot of the district lines did change for decades. Um, by, the, by the early 1960s, you had a situation where in, in the states like Michigan and Texas, where the most populous house district had um, four times the number of people of the least populous district in, uh, uh, in, in a given state. And again, Michigan and Texas were the kind of the biggest offenders there. And uh, reformers in the middle of the 20th century wanted to combat this malapportionment problem. Uh, and so what they... Uh, um, uh, uh, what happened was that the Supreme Court finally weighed in uh, and said that uh, uh, malapportionment was, was, was against the Constitution. And so in a series of landmark decisions, uh, 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 the Supreme Court did away with malapportionment in, in a decision called Baker v. Carr, and then Westbury v. Sanders dealt with congressional districts and malapportionment. Uh, uh, Reynolds v. Sims dealt with uh, malapportionment in state legislatures. So 
at, at, at long last, the court said the districts at least have to have equal population. Um, however, the Supreme Court has never said that partisan gerrymandering um, is illegal, and they sort of reiterated that finding in uh, uh, Rucho v. Common Cause, the uh, 2019 uh, Supreme Court decision. And so partisan gerrymandering is okay, um, but, uh, but, but uh, malapportionment is not. So the districts have to have equal numbers of people, um, but they don't necessarily, but they can be drawn to for partisan ben uh, benefit for one side or the other. Um, if you look at the kind of redistricting conversation in the 1970s and 80s, um, the, Democ the Republicans were often the ones who were um, critical of so-called gerrymandering, in large part because Democrats did it more often and they had control of the redistricting process um, in many more states than the, uh, than the Republicans did. And in 1989, George H.W. Bush, who was president at the time, actually proposed um, basically the kinds of um, federal prohibitions on gerrymandering that Democrats are now proposing today. Um, Democrats are likelier to oppose gerrymandering or want some sort of federal prohibition on gerrymandering because Republicans have come to dominate um, the process. And that was, that was true in the 2010 redistricting cycle after that census. Uh, and also was true, uh, it is true in, in this uh, uh, redistricting cycle. So I'm just gonna share my screen here real quick. And I wanna just show a couple of images. Um, first of all, this is the famous uh, gerrymandering cartoon, which again, I think is probably arguably the most famous uh, uh, editorial cartoon in American history. And you can see the, the offending district there uh, uh, drawn as, as what, what is the gerrymander. It kind of looks like the salamander or dragon or something like that. Uh, and then in uh, redistricting for this 2020 cycle, which is really just getting underway now because the, um, the census has been, uh, the, the census results were delayed in part because of the pandemic and for some other reasons. But um, this shows the party control of redistricting by state, Republicans in red, Democrats in blue. You can see there's a lot more red on that map uh, than there are, than there is blue. Um, there also has been kind of a reform movement in recent years, particularly out West. Those are the states in yellow that have a commission system to draw to draw new districts. Uh, and so that has been sort of a, a growing reform over time, but most states draw their districts the same way that they always have, which is that um, it, it's the state legislature decides to draw the maps and then usually the governor has um, veto power over uh, over the maps. Uh, of, uh, now that's not always true in every state. North Carolina, for instance, is one state um, where the Democratic governor Roy Cooper does not have um, power to veto the maps that the uh, that the Republicans would draw. But again, there's so most most states still have kind of a partisan line drawing process, and you know the the, the U.S. Supreme Court has stayed out of partisan gerrymandering. Um, there are some racial considerations to redistricting that uh, that I think David is going to get into in, 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 his, uh, in his conversation. But this is just a kind of a, I would say a lot of people think this is a problem in uh, American politics that we don't really have a national solution for. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and toss it over to David. Thank you. Wow, that was, that was, a, that was a, uh, a power walk through, a, through a, a complicated subject. And obviously just wanna, um, emphasize that after after I talk for a few minutes that Kyle and I uh, will take your questions and we can direct this conversation uh, however you think appropriate. Um, so I am, I'm gonna start by, by saying, so a lot of books have been written about how certain chemicals have, um, have changed the course of world history. You know, the books about oil, of course, and books about salt. Uh, my uh, view of American politics uh, is that it has been driven more than anything else uh, in the last uh, 60 or 70 years by another chemical. Uh, and I will share my, I'm not gonna share my screen and show you what that chemical is to get started. And it is Freon. Uh, I would say that Freon is the, has, been the, has been the driving force uh, in, in, in American politics in terms of a chemical. Um, because the widespread availability of air conditioning uh, since World War II uh, has changed, the, has been the driver of the fundamental demographic shift um, that, that we probably all know about intuitively. It's pretty dramatic and I'll give you some numbers here. The one that took political power away from the industrial and urban Northeast and gave it to the burgeoning suburbs of the newly air conditioned Sunbelt. That's mass manifest, manifested itself 
in a pretty dramatic way in the reapportionment of the house, which is of course the the predicate to and the first cousin of redistricting. And by the way, we should just stop and remind ourselves uh, because this this is sort of a, a civics 101 thing that you learn about in high school that while every state has um, the, the, the Senate size is fixed in the constitution at two senators per state, They're, the house size is not fixed uh, in the constitution and has and grew, grew steadily until uh, that period in the 1920s that Kyle just talked about when the house decided or, or house and Senate and the president enacted a law to fix the house at 435 members. It's only changed briefly since then when Alaska and Hawaii were admitted it bumped up by a couple of seats just briefly into the 1960s. So that 435 number uh, is just, it's fixed by law. It's not fixed by the constitution, it changes. So in the, um, in the intervening time, um, since the early days, um, before air conditioning, uh, wait a minute, where, well, how come I'm not being able to advance my screen? Help me, help me, help me. There we go, I worked there. So New York, uh, sent the biggest delegation to Congress without fail from 1812 right through the 1960s. And Pennsylvania had the second biggest delegation of any state from the War of 1812 right through the 1950s. Uh, but since then, of course, we know that it's been California that has had the biggest delegation. And now, even though it's going to lose a seat for the first time since statehood, it's been growing, 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 growing. It's now its population has grown as fast as some other states. It is still going to send one out of every nine House members to the Capitol next year. Uh, next year, as as the uh, as the map showed, um, Texas is going to send 38 members, which is 14 more than just since the 1970s. And Florida will have doubled its delegation uh, in just the last half century. Um, these these numbers explain the shifting power dynamics in Congress as well. Uh, if you look at if you're walking around the Capitol and you are uh, looking at the portraits that line the walls, the speaker's lobby, and the various leadership offices, you'll see something dramatically dramatic. Since World War II, we've had four speakers, eight majority or minority leaders, six party whips, and a dozen Democratic caucus and Republican conference chairs who have come from the Sun Belt, um, including, of course, these two, um, Nancy Pelosi and Kevin McCarthy, both from California, of course, Actually, the first time the speaker and the minority leader have both been from the same state. Um, and in all the history of the House before World War II, that same region had produced only 10 people in the leadership, most of them actually from, from Texas. Um, now, congressional history has been shaped, at least in much in modern times, by the redistricting process and the way it's been exploited by both parties. Uh, it's my view that the map making for the 1990s. Uh, as Kyle suggested, I would say, is the most important redistricting ever uh, in terms of, of, of how it has shaped the power dynamic because of it's had some lasting consequential ways uh, that it has locked in this notion that the self-interest of both parties would be maximized uh, during the redistricting process. Um, after the George W. Bush administration proposed some of the redistricting reforms that Kyle mentioned and those didn't work out, um, he and his assistant attorney general for civil rights, John Dunn, uh, not the poet, not the poet we all studied in school, but this guy, John Dunn, former uh, Republican leader of the state Senate in New York, uh, they came up with an ingenious uh, plan for the redistricting of the 1990s, which was to essentially uh, help the Democrats maximize their uh, ability to leverage the Voting Rights Act and its interest in enacting more people of color to Congress in a way that at the same time allowed the Republicans to capitalize on their burgeoning strength across the South. Uh, the result was, so what they did was John Dunn and, and the Justice Department supported maps using the powers of the Voting Rights Act, which at the moment don't exist, this so-called pre-clearance requirement that has since been struck down by the Supreme Court to essentially support maps that crammed as many black Democrats into mostly urban, a couple of rural districts as possible in order to free up the rest of these states across the South to elect Republicans from 
the suburbs and the rural areas. And the result has had an impact on the power dynamic of Congress to this day. Um, in 1992, astonishingly, there were 13 new black members elected from newly drawn districts across almost all of them in the South, a few in, in the Rust Belt. Uh, and four of the people elected in 1992 hold positions of power uh, today. Uh, there they are. Uh, Jim Clyburn, of course, who's the House Democratic whip, uh, benefited from a new district drawn to elect a black, a black member in South Carolina. Bobby Scott of Virginia, the chairman of the Education and Labor Committee. Uh, Benny Thompson of Mississippi, who's the chairman of the Homeland Security Committee and now the special committee uh, to investigate the January 6th insurrection. Uh, and Eddie Bernice Johnson of Texas, uh, who is the chairman of the Science Committee, and sort of a, but one more line about her, which is this this rise of of uh, black uh, black members into Congress uh, was they had sort of been held at bay in some pretty powerful positions in the state legislature. Eddie Bernice Johnson uh, got the enviable position of being the state senator in Austin, who got put in charge of re, of the redistricting effort in Texas that year, back when. Uh, the Democrats still ran the show in Texas, and she made sure, of course, to conveniently draw herself a dis draw a district in the Dallas area that neatly mirrored her state Senate district, and we have her as a member of Congress today. Um, so it, this it didn't just assure the uh, the the, uh, the rise of, of black Democrats in a position of power. It, this same redistricting uh, is what helped either not so much produce. But, but, but assure the continued political success of the triumvirate that uh, ran the House uh, after the big, the historic takeover by the House Republicans, by the Republicans of the House in 1994. Um, you'll, of course, most people will, will uh, recognize the man at the podium, Newt Gingrich of Georgia, whose suburban Georgia Atlanta district was shored up um, by that same redistricting and to his left, uh, on the far left, Tom DeLay, whose Houston area district got made more Republican by that same redistricting, and Dick Armey from uh, north of Dallas, whose Plano area district, same thing. Uh, the, the, the drawing of the maps to elect Eddie Bernice Johnson and a couple of other Democrats in Texas uh, made, it, made it a sure thing that these two would be locked into their seats for as long as they, as they needed to. Um, now, of course, it was it was it was Tom Delay. We should mention who who um, took that lesson uh, to a new level. And in the nineteen um, in in the early wait a minute, when was that? <laughs> in the early in the early two thousands, um, engineered one of the the most dramatic and controversial mid district being re, re, uh, uh, of of a state. As Kyle said, there's nothing in the law that says states can't redraw their districts more often than in the first two years of a new year after the census. Uh, and after the Republicans took over the state house in Austin, uh, delay uh, arranged for a mid-districting, mid-decade redistricting of Texas. Um, some of it was struck down, but it did help produce uh, two of the most important Republicans in Congress today. Um, Kevin Brady on your left, the top Republican on the Ways and Means Committee. Kay Granger on your right, now the who was then the mayor of Fort Worth, saw a, a new ability to run for Congress after this, uh, this redistricting, and they are power players today. Um, what did Tom DeLay do? We should just sort of stop and mention the, the two most important vocabulary words in redistricting, and I didn't come up with goofy images to, to represent them, like cracked eggs or overly packed suitcases, but they are called packing and cracking. So packing is the uh, is the phenomena is the is the map maker's notion of um, packing as many of your opponents' voters into as few districts as possible to assure that you, the map maker, your party will win everywhere else. And cracking is sort of the reverse of that, which is um, is spreading your voters over as many districts as possible to assure that they will have narrow majorities in as many districts as possible. Um, it was packing, by the way, in terms of how, how redistricting has shaped the course of the modern Congress or congressional history. You could argue that it was packing um, that essentially uh, assured uh, that, the that the Republicans 
um, would lose one of their most influential leaders of all time after the after the Gingrich delay army generation. Um, it was it was packing that made sure that this scene would happen just uh, in just uh, less than a decade ago. Uh, that is Eric Cantor conceding uh, defeat uh, in the Republican primary in Virginia. Arguably, the it was the first time a um, a sitting House Republican leader had ever lost a primary for renomination. It was arguably one of the biggest upsets in congressional history. And the reason it happened was because one of the reasons it happened, um, there were many reasons, some to do with him, but an important reason was that Virginia had just redrawn its districts to pack uh, as many uh, Democrats and black Democrats into, into seats in Richmond and the Hampton Roads and the, and the Norfolk and Portsmouth area as possible to assure that Republicans would win everywhere else. And in order to do that, they had to give Eric Cantor a bunch of new voters, unfamiliar voters that were unfamiliar with him and arguably more conservative than he was. Uh, and that did not help uh, him win re-election. Um, another tried and true technique is, the, is, the, um, is when the party in power uh, draws maps that forces two incumbents from the other party uh, into the same district, ensuring that at least one of them, of course, will lose. Um, according to um, numbers crunched by uh, a, a treasured former colleague of mine at Congressional Quarterly, where I spent about 25 years, a guy who now works for Bloomberg News named Greg Giroux, who crunches political numbers like nobody's business. Uh, in the past 40 years, 34 Democrats and 19 Republicans have been forced out of Congress in primaries at the hands of a colleague. Um, so let's think what would have, so here's a few examples. Uh, what would have happened uh, if if Lynn Rivers on your on your left, who was a favorite of progressives and feminists, had been able to oust John Dingell from Detroit uh, in the primary of 2002? Uh, instead, he survived and got to have one more very very influential turn as the chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee. What would have happened uh, to the cause of combative conservatism at the Capitol? Would it have accelerated even earlier than it did had Bob Barr, uh, a progenitor of that movement, survived his Republican primary against uh, fellow Georgian John Linder? Couldn't find a picture of Linder and Bob Barr together, but there's Bob Barr. Um, now, a decade later, uh, the Ohio um, Republican Party drew this rather legendary district known as the Snake by the Lake which as you can see, if you've got good eyesight, connects Toledo uh, on the left, snakes all the way down to, to the Cleveland area. Um, this was drawn um, by the Republicans to make sure that uh, either Marcy Kaptur of, of Toledo or Dennis Kucinich, a favorite, uh, and, and you know, and, uh, uh, Bernie Sanders, an acolyte of the, or an avatar of the super progressive movement in Congress, that one of them would lose. Um, might the cause of uh, liberal progressiveness change a little bit if it had been uh, Kucinich who won instead of Marcy Kaptur. Um, similarly, there's another uh, pretty crazy looking district. This was, this was uh, the same year the Michigan Republicans decided to pack as many Democrats in, as possible into a, this district that somehow connects Detroit and Pontiac. Um, and it meant that uh, uh, Gary Peters and a guy named um, Hanson Clark would have to face off against each other. What would have happened uh, to the cause of uh, uh, Democrats in Michigan if, if Gary Peters had lost? Instead, of course, he's gone on to become an influential senator and the chairman of the Senate Homeland Committee. Um, didn't, I'm not going to use a map here. Uh, similarly, the Democrats uh, in Illinois decided to get rid of one Republican. Uh, in northern, in, in the collar counties outside Chicago by making these two run against each other. This guy, Don Manzula, lost. Uh, this guy on your right, Adam Kinzinger, uh, triumphed and of course has now become a thorn, an important thorn in the Republican side ever since. So now we that sort of is a segue into what's gonna happen now. Uh, surely there'll be some incumbent versus incumbent matchups drawn um, in, in many states, especially the states that are losing seats. Um, will Republicans are gonna, uh, the, uh, the Illinois has to lose let another, yet another seat 
Um, will the Republicans down in Springfield um, try to save another Republican House member by sacrificing Kinzer, Kinzinger because of his uh, never Trumpism? Uh, will the uh, New York Democrats who have the chance to uh, pick up as many as four or five seats, will one of the seats that they pick up um, uh, happen by pushing uh, Elise Stefanik on your left, the new chairwoman of the House Republican Conference into the same district as, as Claudia Tenney? Uh, will, um, will Texas Republicans who have, who were able to add several seats around Austin 10 years ago through this cracking methodology, now those Republican, cracked Republican seats, the cracking has, doesn't work anymore. Will they decide to shore up the seat of uh, Lloyd Doggett, uh, Austin's own Lloyd Doggett? Um, will they decide to give him a really safe Democratic seat? And if they do, uh, the result could be that we know who the next Democratic chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee is. So there are dozens of stories like this. Uh, maybe Kyle and I can go into some more. Uh, but stay tuned and we are eager to answer your questions. Stop in the share. Well, I tell you, you two both have lots to say and uh, it, we've got several questions that are coming up. Um, so let me kind of pass these around. Um, someone inquired about the effort that Arnold Schwarzenegger is leading to deal with creating commissions that are nonpartisan. Uh, would either one of you like to opine on that matter? Uh, well, Schwarzenegger was a, was a very important figure in the passage of California's redistricting commission, um, which the voters approved in 2010. Of course, in California, you've got so much direct democracy. So there's all sorts of stuff that ends up on the ballot, including the, the recall of the governor last week that, that, that didn't work. But um, the voters approved that system in 2010. And so it was in place for the 20, 2012 um, redistricting cycle. And uh, what ended up happening is actually Democrats got a great map out of that in California. Um, and there was some belief that the Democrats kind of played the game of the redistricting commission better because the commission was supposed to respect certain communities of interest, et cetera. And Democrats, as ProPublica reported back in 2011, Democrats kind of created these community groups that would go testify at these com commission meetings that essentially espouse communities of interest that Oh, by the way, also connected to the Democratic political interests. And uh, California went from, I mean, California has become very democratic over, over the course of, of, of the last several decades. Um, the Democrats got as high as a 46 to 7 advantage in the California House delegation, uh, was 34 to 19 at the start of the 2010s. Um, Republicans came back, picked up four new seats, but it's still 40 to 11 Democrats. 42 to 11 Democratic, um, which is pretty striking. And so it, it also gets into, you know, not everyone wants these commissions because ultimately even commissions that are nonpartisan, maybe they're not doing partisan gerrymandering, but they do have to make decisions that invariably are probably going to make one side unhappy and one side happy. So it's, it's a hard process to do because different people can have different objectives in redistricting and those people aren't necessarily, you know, a lot of them could be right just from their own point of view. You know, I might say, oh, we should, we should, um, have as many competitive districts as possible. And David might say, uh, uh, no, we should respect incumbents or you know, what have you. There's nothing inherently wrong with either of those points. It's just that different people can prioritize different things. Right, and just to, 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 to follow up on that, the, the question may come up or it, it may not, but uh, to connect it to the news of the present day, um, over the summer, the, some, some, some people uh, paying, in our audience today may know about the so-called For the People Act, which was the, the sort of broad, multifaceted uh, so-called democracy reform package, largely referred to as a voting rights bill because it would set federal, federal standards for voting. Um, it initially included uh, a mandate that all states use independent commissions to draw their house districts. Um, that, has, that, that language, uh, the House has passed that bill. It's a non-starter in the Senate. Uh, Joe Manchin and Amy Klobuchar in the in the Senate have come up with a a revised bill, a nar slightly narrower bill uh, that gets rid of that that requirement. Uh, that requirement was actually proved uh, somewhat unpopular among uh, some 
Democrats, including uh, the man whose slide I showed, whose picture I showed before, Benny Thompson, actually the only Democrat to vote against that bill in the House because he uh, he believes, uh, as do several other members of the Congressional Black Caucus, that turning map making over to commissions nationwide would result in a in a weakening of of the African American uh, power bases around the country. So now that the new bill, the Mansion uh, Klobuchar bill, which goes by another uh, apple pie and motherhood sounding name like the Freedom Freedom to Vote Act, I guess it's called. It incentivizes states to use these commissions, but does not require them. And another thing, the, the very useful map that Kyle showed, um, you have to make some judgment calls about which is a truly a commission state and which is truly a partisan state. Uh, for example, I noticed that he showed a blue, he showed New York as blue. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. He showed New York as blue. Um, and in neighboring New Jersey as yellow, um, even though uh, New York technically does ha have an independent commission, but the commission is so easily overridden by the Democratic state legislature that that's an appropriate, uh, that's appropriate to call it blue. Uh, in New Jersey, um, some are arguing the same thing is effectively the case that the New Jersey has an independent commission, but that the, the tie-breaking chairman of the, uh, chairperson of the commission, um, the Republicans would argue is so clearly a partisan Democrat that it's effectively turned that state over the Democrats as well. Now, now that you raise this whole question about voting rights, um, uh, would either one of you like to, uh, maybe we should have Kyle, you're from the crystal ball theory. Um, what's the future of the Klobuchar Mansion Voting Rights Act? It, you know, you, you're going to need 60 votes in the Senate for it. And it doesn't seem like there are, you know, 10 Republicans who would want to go along with that to avoid it being filibustered. So I don't, I guess I don't necessarily see a path forward for it, save, you know, getting rid of the filibuster. And we know that not every Democratic senator wants to do away with the filibuster. Certainly Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema are kind of the, the, the leading voices against doing away with the filibuster, although it seems like there may be some other members who would not be crazy about getting rid of it either. Um, so I don't, I guess I don't really see where it goes. There's some, some talk about carving out some sort of exemption of the filibuster that would involve voting rights laws, but, but you know, that seems like a non-starter non for Manchin, but um, so it's a, at, at the current time, I don't necessarily see a path forward for it, although sometimes the way these things go is that you, you kind of go through the whole process and then all of a sudden Joe Manchin and Senate get to yes for a certain way of doing it. Um, and maybe that happens at that point, but as of right now, I don't see much of a path forward. So here's another, you know, look ahead. Maybe David, you can start with this. In the coming midterm elections, from your predictions, what will have the greatest impact? Will it be redistricting? Will it be uh, voter, vote, you know, who's able to vote? Will there be voter you know, different ways for voter participation, voter suppression, or will it be a policy matter where people are up in arms about inflation or, you know, fill in the blank? Right, well, I guess the, 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 the easy way out is to say all of the above, but I would say that um, it's redistricting that it would have the, that in general last for five elections. Whereas no, no policy matter um, and probably, well, so no policy matter lasts for five elections. Um, I think that over, over the course of the decade, um, I still hold out some hope that over the course of the decade, there will be um, some federal effort to, to, to repel uh, some of these state efforts to ultimately to suppress the vote. But I mean, the reason this is such an important topic and why we're on this one is that it lasts, it lasts a long time. And, I, you know, depending, I've done a couple, couple of back of the back of the envelope uh, calculations. Uh, and you could argue that just the map making that the Republicans control will, I mean, maybe, maybe Kyle's got a more exact number. I've, I've come up with somewhere between eight and 12 seats that they can they can just count on picking picking up eight or twelve seats, based on, that's a gross, based on based on redistricting. Now, I mentioned New York. 
New York might be able to pare that back by like four. But I'm not sure where else in the country you're going to get as many Democrat, as, as much de Democratic gerrymandering to reverse what the Republicans did, can do on their side. So I guess I would say, you know, gerrymandering sort of is a gerrymandering lasts in a way that many of the other things you mentioned don't. Yeah, I mean, I agree that the, the, the uh, uh, you know, the Republicans do have more power for, you know, gerrymandering in, in, in more places than the Democrats do. You know, David mentioned New York is a place where Democrats might be able to mine several seats. Illinois is another one where Democrats control the process, but they're already up to 13-5, a 13-5 advantage in that delegation. Illinois is losing a seat, so, you know, maybe they get to 14 to 3, but we're only talking about, you um, you know, Democrats adding an extra seat, maybe eliminating two, two you know, two Republican seats. Um, uh, and, and, you know, Maryland is another state that's being watched where Democrats have the power there, but that's already a 7-1 Democratic state. Um, there's been some thought that Democrats could maybe draw an 8 map by eliminating Andy Harris, who represents the Eastern Shore. Um, but, but again, you, you know, you sort of turn it over and, and you can look at like Florida and Texas and North Carolina and Georgia. You know, Republicans are probably going to be, be able to improve their position through redistricting alone in, in all of those states to at least some degree. You know, maybe it's just an extra seat in Georgia. Maybe it's an extra two, three or four in Texas uh, or Florida. Um, so, and, you know, again, with, with, with just Republicans needing to pick up just net five seats to win the House, you know, even if we had sort of a neutral political environment next year, which we usually don't have in a midterm, you know, it often breaks against the president's party to a significant degree. But um, even if you had a close election next year, redistricting could end up being effectively deciding who the majority party is. Um, now, again, if it's like, you know, Republicans win 25 seats because it's like a wave environment, that sort of thing, then you couldn't really say redistricting was a reason for that because that's more seats than Republicans can, can net out of redistricting, but in a close outcome, redistricting might be the, the, the most important thing. And, and if you're trying to assess the House right now, it is the most important thing because we don't know what the environment's going to look like a year from now, but we do have a sense as to what, you know, who controls the redistricting power where. And we are starting to get maps coming out. Um, like tech, I think Texas is probably going to come out with a Republican map. I think it's uh, uh, maybe a day or two, maybe Thursday. Uh, and so we'll get a better sense of where this goes. But you know, the other thing is that there are always lawsuits about this. And so, um, and, and what sometimes happens too is that there'll be a lawsuit that eventually resolves, you know, three, four years from now. Um, and there could be kind of a, you know, mid-decade changes to maps because of, of court action. Um, you know, uh, David was talking about uh, packing and cracking just to go back to Virginia and you know, the Eric Cantor example, that, dis that, that uh, map was partially reversed because um, Bobby Scott's district, which runs from ran from Richmond to uh, to Hampton Roads, and basically took in how, as many black voters as possible. Um, uh, the federal court decided that that was an un, uh, illegal packing of black voters, and so um, Scott still has a very safe Democratic district that's now focused more on Hampton Roads. Um, but that created a new uh, a, a new district that had a significant black voting population that uh, Democrat Don McEachin, black Democrat, now represents. It also slightly weakened Republican performance in Cantor's old district, Virginia 7, which contributed to Abigail Spanberger, Democrat, winning that district in 2018. So this is a story that will be continued to told, be told throughout the decade, even though you know, almost all the redistricting action is going to happen uh, between now and you know, primary season next year. So Kyle, you, you have some expertise in Ohio. Um, one of our listeners uh, has been opining that Ohio's, Ohio has a unique thing where we name our congressional districts, the snake on the lake, the duck, the toilet. Um, and that it's, it appears now that there's gonna be a court case uh, that will that go to the Supreme Court? Um, what, will, what will happen in a state like Ohio and what's the history? Has this ever, you know, is this customary or how, put it in context for us? Ohio has a new redistricting system in place um, for Congress and for state legislature that uh, the voters approved last decade and is now being tested out. And it is not a commission system, but what it does is it, um, particularly for the congressional map, it mandates that only a certain number of counties can be split, that districts have to be compact, et cetera. But it doesn't necessarily forbid Republicans who control the state from gerrymandering. And so what might happen is that Republicans might essentially draw for what will probably be a 13 to 2 maybe Republican map. It's 12-4 Republican now, has losing a seat. 
And what might happen is that the Ohio Supreme Court might end up kind of adjudicating this map because Democrats would sue and say that it's unfair and that it, that it goes against this new redistricting system and the new guidelines. And then uh, the Ohio Supreme Court, which is 4-3 Republican, but the Republican Chief Justice Maureen O'Connor is thought to be maybe friendlier to Democrats on these redistricting matters. And so they might intervene in, the, in this, but it, it brings up a, a, a larger important point, which is that state Supreme Courts are getting more and more involved in redistricting. We saw in both uh, North Carolina and Pennsylvania last decade that Democratic controlled courts threw out Republican gerrymanders because they determined based on state law that they were illegal. Um, and maybe that's still happen in Ohio, but there are a number of other state Supreme Courts across the country that are important in this regard. Florida is another one, Florida voters put in their own uh, constitution a prohibition against uh, you know, excessive gerrymandering in 2010. The Florida Supreme Court threw out a Republican gerrymander last decade, but now there's a feeling that the court is more conservative now, and maybe they actually won't intervene and, and enforce that constitutional provision. You know, the, the U.S., the, the, the federal courts, while they do intervene in these racial redistricting matters, kind of what we're talking about with Virginia, um, they're not going to get involved in partisan gerrymandering, but state courts are. Ohio is an example, but there are many others across the country, and they're an important, I would say, an, an increasingly important player in uh, redistricting. Right. And so can either of you kind of give us a, a little bit of history here? Um, we're talking a lot about the courts. Um, has, have the courts ever changed uh, the, changed the outcome? Of well, district. So, if, can I, uh, so just to underscore a little bit of what Kyle was saying, so the it is important to think that the that the federal courts and the state courts have, have gone pretty far apart on this in the last few years. Um, the the federal courts, I in, especially the Supreme Court, for over the course of three decades, sort of when of course the membership of, of the Supreme Court was changing and becoming more conservative. Uh, they hinted, the U.S. Supreme Court did, that there would that there was some point at which partisan gerrymandering would become unconstitutional. They kept sort of hinting at it, but then never saying what that point was. Uh, and then the and then the so racial gerrymandering clearly unconstitutional, and the court has issued many many decisions about that. But partisan gerrymandering, they never came up with a. They could never come up with a, a rule, a standard, a bright line. When when is partisan gerrymandering too much? And then the courts makeup became decidedly conservative, and they decided in a, in a case in, in 2019, two summers ago, called Ru Common Cause against Ruccio, the Supreme Court said five to four that there would never be that there was no there was no line that they forget that the federal courts have no business refereeing partisan gerrymandering. So that's it. For now. Meanwhile, uh, most notably uh, in Pennsylvania and in North Carolina, uh, state Supreme Courts said that their own state constitutions did had a essentially a guarantee of um, th th that the equal protection clauses of their own state constitutions and the, and the uh, the equality of elections, the fairness of election clauses in their constitutions meant that state courts could referee partisan gerrymandering. And in the case of both Pennsylvania and North Carolina, maps were thrown out in the middle of the last decade and replaced. The one in Pennsylvania, as I recall, uh, it went it went from a um, eleven to three Dem uh, Republican advantage to a seven to seven tie. And now I think the Pennsylvania Democrats have even a little bit of an edge. Um, and in North Carolina, famously, uh, one of the a North Carolina legislator. Uh, said we're gonna we're gonna draw an 11, 11 to three map with Republicans in charge because we're in charge and the only reason we're not going to draw it 12 to two is because we can't figure out how to do that uh, so those were thrown out those were thrown out and as Kyle said there are other I think such um, election equal protection election clauses are in the state constitutions of something like 20 states and so I think we'll see a lot more litigation like that in the in the years ahead. You know, just to just to one one other point here. Um, so four four congressional maps of consequence were thrown out throughout the last decade. Um, we mentioned Virginia, Florida, also in the 2016 cycle. North Carolina was thrown out in 2016, but 
Republicans there were able to draw another gerrymander that preserved their existing advantage. Uh, in advance of 2018, as David mentioned, uh, Pennsylvania threw out their maps and then North Carolina had to throw out an additional series of maps in 2020. So four, four important states. Um, let's say that no house maps had ever changed throughout the decade. Um, and that, you know, Florida, Virginia, North Carolina, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and, and Virginia, Florida, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Virginia, sorry, um, had all had the same maps. Democrats would have won the House majority in 2018, but based on some calculations that we did, Republicans would have won the House majority in 2020 under the old map. So this stuff is really important. And, you know, I mentioned that, you know, there have been instances in the past where new district lines determine the majority in Congress, you could argue that this collection of new house maps over the course of the 2010s helped deter, or was, was, was a key factor in determining a house majority, not in 2018, but in 2020. Hmm. Great stuff. And one of the inquiries, um, many, some of our, our listeners are concerned about the emergence of extremism in politics. Um, <clears throat> both um, in both parties and opine that that extremism is largely a part of the fact that the districts are not competitive. And the only way to really address it is to ensure competitive districts. Is that something that you've given any thought to? Do you agree with that opinion? And if so, how would we ensure competitive districts? Well, I um, I agree in part, but I because I, I I do think that you know a consequence of partisan control over so many of the maps is that both it's in it you know parties will do what what works for them and what works for them is is ensuring the maximum number of safe seats for each side. But I will also say that that and this is a larger topic, but that this that the the way um, there's been some organic. Uh, partisan segregation of the country that doesn't have to do with, that is not politically driven. I mean, you know, people, uh, urban people, I mean, there's lots of studies about, you ask liberal Democrats, where do they wanna live? And they say, I wanna live in a place near public transportation and within walking distance of a coffee shop and within walking distance uh, of a place to go uh, to the movies. And you ask Republicans where they wanna live and they say, I wanna live within driving distance of a big box retailer and my mega church um, and, you know, there's, so there's some self-segregation. I mean, that's, that's, I'm being painting with a very broad brush and there's been a lot of smart research done on this, but some of this is how, how Americans themselves have decided to live with, they've decided to live with like-minded people. They've decided, you know, in it and watch TV that's like-minded and do all this stuff that puts them in red and blue boxes, even before the map makers get to work. You know, the, the other thing too is that you know we, yeah the, the house has become more more partisan and polarized but the senate has too and the senate's got nothing to do with gerrymandering now the senate is a poster child i, I mentioned the, the m word malapportionment you know the senate is a malapportioned <laughs> legislature uh, or, or or chamber that is you know protected from the supreme court's malapportionment decisions because it's written in the constitution um but senate again is is, is is different than it used to be and again there are lots of larger trends going on here the other thing is that even if you wanted to maximize the number of competitive districts, you probably you would still have a lot of uncompetitive districts because unless you were to draw really mangled lines that would connect, you know, dark blue urban centers in a little line to you know red rural areas, you know, you're not going to be drawing a lot of competitive districts in Los Angeles and New York City. You're not going to be drawing a lot of competitive districts in um, Western Kansas and Western Nebraska. You know, those that's a very deeply Republican place. So, I mean, I, look, I, you certainly could do more to increase competitiveness, but even if you did that, you would still have a lot of districts that just aren't, aren't really competitive or are competitive potentially in a primary as opposed to a general election. Best, the best, and not to, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shill, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to advertise for a competitor of Kyle's, maybe this, the, there's, there is a, uh, if you really want to geek out on this in a, in a quite easy on the eyes way, the Atlas of Redistricting, uh, I think it's 538, right, Kyle? And you can go to any you can go to any state you want. This is this is good for the, for the last ten years, but it's illustrative. Go to your go to your home state, and they have uh, redrawn the districts. I think five or six different ways to protect incumbents, to elect as many people of color as possible, to elect as many Republicans as possible, to elect as many Democrats as possible, and to create as many 
genuinely competitive seats as possible. Um, and there's some pretty, pretty interesting looking maps. And so, so as Kyle said from the very, uh, from the very start, an important point is that you know, there's lots of ways to gerrymander. <laughs> so we've talked about the importance of the state legislature in drawing these lines. But let us also go back to the fact that the state legislatures themselves are districted in a partisan right. manner. Right. Has there ever been instances where the state legislative lines have been challenged and gone to the Supreme Court? Do the federal courts engage or is the state, is it strictly state courts for, for state legislative uh, fairness? So the, the, the Reynolds v. Sims decision from 1964, that did do away with malapportionment of state legislatures, which was actually seen, I think, as a bigger deal in terms of governance and whatnot and, and rural overrepresentation than, 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 the, um, than the, the decisions that dealt with, with uh, Congress. But so the, the Supreme Court, they can go in and do, you know, uh, uh, intervene with in state legislative matters, but they have chosen not to deal with because um, I think one of the, uh, there were a number of cases folded into the, the recent Supreme Court, the Common Cause decision in 2019. And I think one of them dealt with the Wisconsin state legislative lines. I think so. Um, so, so the, you know, th there are no federal prohibitions on congressional partisan gerrymandering, but also not on state legislative partisan gerrymandering. Right. And just to, to underscore, just in case, lest, lest there be any misunderstanding, this is only about partisanship. This is not about race. Um, this is just about this, this notion of as the, the cliche that the, the, the reformers have a very great way of summarizing this. This is about the politicians being able to choose their own voters rather than the other way around, which is sort of how you, a great way, if you're trying to explain this to somebody for the first time to introduce the topic of partisan gerrymandering. Well, you guys, it's been phenomenal uh, to talk with people who have such historical context. So we got one remaining question, um, which is people are, are questioning the size of the house. Mm. Um, the, the house is set at 435 because that's all the building will hold. Um, I mean, you know, let's be, let's be clear about this. This was not like, this is the magic number that we need, that a 435 person body is how you ensure mm -hmm. appropriate deliberative decorum and, you know, best policy possible can come from 435 individuals. It's because that's how many people fit on the floor. Right. But, we now have many more people in a house district. Has there been any discussion about a change in the size? Do you think that would be influential, important, wise? Give us your last crystal balls opinion. You, you want to go for, I, I'll, let, me, let me do this. I'll go for one minute fast, um, which is, I don't think there's been any uh, uh, motion with traction on it, but there are there are some really interesting ideas. Uh, Don Byer, congressman from Virginia, Democrat of Virginia, is carrying this bill for like the third Congress that would grow the size of the House, but do a couple of things that would do a lot more to ensure competition. He would his bill would create multi-member districts, so each there would be uh, maybe the same number of congressional districts, but they would have. I think there would be a few fewer congressional districts, but they would each have more than one member. And those members would be chosen through ranked choice voting, which is this is going down a whole other rabbit hole. But in other words, you'd rank your choices. And the idea here is that if um, uh, suburban Maryland uh, had a district that represented was represented by three members and they were elected by ranked choice voting, that maybe it wouldn't be all three Democrats. You'd have a Republican and two Democrats. So that that's probably the um, in academic circles and good government circles, the, the idea with the most currency for a way to use growth of the house to create more competition and less partisanship. Uh, and, you know, there have been a couple of times or once where, where the, house, the size of the house did expand behind, beyond 435 when Hawaii and 
Uh, Alaska were added. It temporarily went up to 437 uh, and then went back down to 435 after the 1960 reapportionment. And more recently, um, Utah felt like they basically got, got screwed out of a seat in the 2000s apportionment. And there was, there was this proposal to uh, give Utah a, a seat and also give the District of Columbia a seat. So you go to 437 temporarily, but that didn't end up happening. But um, uh, you know, the, we have, you know, the, the average, the average district rep, it has between, it's going to be about 750,000, 800,000 people. And I think there's a belief that maybe, you know, maybe you could have more members. Um, and just one, one final thing that I feel obligated to mention, which is that uh, I have a book coming out about the his, recent history of the U.S. House called The Long Red Thread. It gets into a lot of this stuff. Uh, and I just felt obliged to mention it. <laughs> So it's coming, coming out, coming out in a couple of weeks, and touches on a lot of the topics that, uh, that that we talked about today. Well, Kaya, we'll have to have you back when your book comes out, and so you can talk about the book because we do uh, often do book talks, um, and you know that that'll give people time to take a look at it, and then, and I'm telling you what, trust our people; they will read the book and they will interrogate you. Um, you know, ask David, he's been on our, uh, our panel question. a number of times and the, the questions are pretty complicated, pretty sophisticated, and we've, we've enjoyed very much uh, you being open to questions and thank you very much. And thank you to our audience. I'm sorry we didn't get to every question today, but we will continue this conversation as we move forward. Looking ahead, um, next week's uh, Lunch Bite you are going to hear from Sam Holiday. Now, how many times have you heard Sam Holiday tell you, good afternoon, here's how you sign in, here's how you do the, the chat, I will take care of your technology. What you don't know is that Sam Holiday is also a historian and, and quite knowledgeable in his director of scholarship. And so he is going to share with us the 100 year anniversary of the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. Uh, the unknown soldiers initially laid in state at the United States Capitol. And we have a very special relationship with the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier because our founder's daughter uh, married someone who had been a guard at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. And so we have been very fortunate to have special understanding of the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. And so if you would join us next week, one of the things that the tomb guards are trying to do is to encourage people across the country to celebrate this 100 year anniversary on uh, Veterans Day this year in their own home communities as a way to acknowledge the service that is provided to the country by people who serve in the military. So please join us. And then looking ahead, no, October and November, we're gonna be addressing the Gilded Age, or as some call it, the first Gilded Age, um, at where we will have a number of historians and practitioners talking about what was the impact of the Gilded Age and the issues that came up, which were, there were challenges to monopolies, there was income inequality, and how can we take learning from history to address the issues of today? So that's what we do here at the Capitol Historical Society. Thank you very much for your support. Uh, we appreciate always your support, your engagement, and look forward to being with you next week. Thank you, David. Thank you, Kyle. Have a good week.